think many of us are from the generation where we get up in the morning on Saturday morning and just sit there that two or three hour block of time and watch cartoons. <laughs> and uh, at least our family did, all my friends, all my friends did. And um, I think my favorite was always Bugs Bunny and Friends. And I think that was an hour long program of cartoons on Saturday morning. And you know, we had Bugs Bunny, we had Elmer Fudd, we had Foghorn, Leghorn, you know, the big chicken. <laughs> listen here, son, now listen. And uh, Speedy Gonzalez and Sylvester and Daffy Duck and Tweety, you know, I thought I thought oh, Tweety, yeah. Um, my favorite by far was the Roadrunner and the Coyote, and I, I don't know why. Um, you know, it certainly wasn't because of the diversity of plot lines. Uh, every Roadrunner episode was pretty much a cookie cutter uh, plot. The coyote would come up with some devious scheme to get the Roadrunner. And uh, soon a big box would arrive from Acme. And in the box would be explosives or an anvil or a giant rubber band or some elaborate piece of equipment or rocket shoes or something and the coyote would get it all set up and the roadrunner would go meep meep and come running through and it never worked. It never worked. And, uh, or it would work too well. And uh, when the coyote went to investigate, you know, why it didn't work, he'd be blown up or he'd fall off a cliff or he'd splat into a cliff or the anvil would fall on him or, you know, this device, it, it always got him in the end. Never once did he ever catch the Roadrunner, thankfully. Because, you know, that's the way it should be. The Roadrunner in the cartoon was the good guy, you know, and the good guy is supposed to win. It was clear that he was the good guy and the coyote was a, the bad guy in some kind of a bumbling, adorable sort of way. And, we, you know, we all know that in life, the good guy is supposed to win. That's just the way it's supposed to be in the world. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a movie where in the end the, the good guy dies, you know, and you all just kind of leave bummed out, you know, and, you know what was that all about? Um, it, just, it just ain't right. You know, imagine a cartoon episode where the coyote actually catches the road runner and proceeds to barbecue and eat him. You know, besides traumatizing an entire generation of children, it would, have, it would have upset our entire notion of the way the world is supposed to work. The Roadrunner is supposed to get away. But you know, in real life, the good guy doesn't always win. We all know that. And uh, at least from a temporal perspective, goodness all doesn't always produce good. But you know, when that happens, it's almost like our world shifts a little bit. It rattles us. It puts us out of perspective. Um, you know, I think all of us at one time or another undergo trials to shake our understanding of how things are supposed to be. You know, we live a good life. We're good people. We obey the Lord as well as best we can. We contribute to His church. And then, bang! You know, we're barbecued and eaten, so to speak. Um, and, you know, keeping the faith like in times like that can be a bit of a challenge. And how to do that is bound up in this prophecy of Obadiah, which is the next of the minor prophets that we're going to be looking at this morning. You know, last week in Amos, we saw the prophet was preaching God's condemnation to an entire array of countries. I mean, he scattergunned it. Every, Israel, Judah, everybody around there got a little piece of that prophecy. Um, basically, God, God said, none were righteous, everybody's sinned, everybody's fallen short of God's glory, and everybody's going to experience God's wrath. Well, this week, it's a bit of a different thing with Obadiah. We're not sure of exactly when he preached, but scholars think it was sometime around 587 B.C., just after the Babylonians had sacked Jerusalem. And instead of Amos' the scattergun prophecy, Obadiah focuses exclusively on just one country, Edom. The country was located just south of the Dead Sea, and a little bit of an Old Testament refresher. The Edomites were descendants from Esau, Jacob's brother. And they were twins, and from the very beginning, their relationship was strange, to say the, to say the least. And the conflict between the two came to a head 
in the days just before their father Isaac died, when Jacob plotted with his mother to steal Esau's blessing as the firstborn. See, Esau as the firstborn was supposed to get his father's blessing, was supposed to take over as head of the clan, was supposed to be the preeminent one after the father died. Jacob gets together, he plans and he plots and he steals the, he steals the blessing from Esau. And after he'd done that and the deceit was discovered, Jason, Jacob fled for fear of his life, rightfully so. He thought it would have killed him if he could have caught him. And after they'd gone their separate ways, Jacob's descendants became the people of Israel, the people of Judah, and Esau's descendants became the Edomites and settled in that area, like I say, to the south of the Dead Sea. And carrying on the tradition started by their brothers, the countries just simply didn't play nicely together. They didn't get along. There was constant conflict. The Edomites played such a consistently adversarial role in Israel's history that Edom sort of becomes an Old Testament synonym for hostile nations. And Israel's estranged brother nation opposed the Israelites at every possible point from the time of the Exodus on. When the Israelites were wandering through the desert those 40 years, they got to the Edomite area and asked for passage. The Edomites said, uh-uh, nope, ain't happening. And so, like from that point on, they were in constant opposition. All the way up until the Babylonian conquest of Judah and Jerusalem, which the Edomites thought was the greatest thing that happened in a long time, they celebrated it and they were quite pleased about it. According to historical records, they hadn't actually participated in the conquest, but they gloated, they celebrated. And so Obadiah basically gives Edom both barrels of his prophecy. He, you know, it's not about everybody else, it's just about Edom. And the entire prophecy contained in this single chapter book is God's judgment of Edom. But the thing about Obadiah is that even though the prophecy was about Edom, it wasn't directed at Edom. It was meant for God's people. And for that reason, I think in spite of this focus on this, co this country over here and all the wrong that they, that they had committed and their condemnation and their rebuke, there's a strong message of encouragement in here for God's people then and for God's people today. And this is especially relevant for those who are facing trials and tribulations. And every commentary I read on Obadiah this week mentioned the same thing. This is a message in spite of the rebukes, in spite of the condemnation, in spite of the judgment, this is actually a message of hope and assurance. And that comes up mainly in verses 15 to 21. And it's that message that I want to explore today. And the first point for those times when the coyote gets the roadrunner, so to speak, in our life, when, when, when things are bad, when things happen, when our vision of how things are supposed to be get a little bit rattled and a little bit out of, out of sync, we're just me meeping along and bang, the am anvil drops on our head. The first point that Obadiah brings up is that what goes around comes around eventually in verses 15 and 16. Where Obadiah writes, the day of the Lord is near for all nations, for all nations, as, you, as you've done it, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head, just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. Like I say, the message, what, what he's saying here is what goes around comes around. There is justice. There is a, a, a connection between behavior and ultimate uh, being or not being. What Edom had done to the people of God, God is going to do to them. The theme of drinking one's punishment here, you know, you'll drink and drink continually and it'll be as if you've never been, uh, as if you've never been. But that's kind of a common theme that pops up occasionally throughout the Old Testament. We see it in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Habakkuk, that same idea. And the idea is the Edomites had drank and celebrated when Jerusalem fell, woohoo, and they were all happy. But there's going to come a day when they, along with all the nations that stand in opposition to God, will simply drink themselves to death, so to speak. Their lives will lead to their death. In fact, this is, like I say, this is not just for Edom. This is for all the nations surrounding Israel. It's for all the nations who stand in opposition to the kingdom of God, then and now. And what God regularly tells his people is that justice will prevail. 
The enemies of God will get what they deserve. There is a connection between good and goodness, between evil and judgment. Sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we don't feel like we're experiencing it. But there is a connection. The enemies of God will get the, what they deserve. Maybe not right this minute. Maybe not even in this life. But ultimately there's that connection. There's going to be times when life deals us a bad hand. You know, that's just life. That's the way it is. We live in a broken, we live in a, in a, in a culture, in a society, in a world where evil exists. And God's letting that be for the time being until Jesus comes back again. But because of that, there's times when the roadrunner gets ambled. There's times in our life when bad things happen. And, and, and we just look at it and say, ah, really? It's just life. And as devastating as it might be, there is going to be a time out here where God sets it right. When God makes it right. The second point that Obadiah makes in verse 17 is that, for basically this point, for God's people, there is deliverance. On Mount Zion, there will be deliverance. It will be holy, and Jacob will possess his, his inheritance. Remember, this prophecy was most likely given while the people of Israel were in exile. The Babylonians had come in, raised their city, destroyed it, knocked down the walls, and they'd been defeated militarily. Their towns and their cities had been destroyed. Their belongings had been taken. Their, many of their family members would have been killed. And those who survived were dragged away and were living in servitude. And for a people whose identity for generations had been, we are the exalted children of the Almighty God, this would have been a bitter, bitter pill. You know, talk about something that just upsets your notion of right and wrong and, and the product of goodness in your life. It's like everything that they believed about themselves, this exile would have just turned it upside down. We are God's people. This isn't how it's supposed to go down for God's people. What's going on here? You know, Peter talks about this sort of cognitive dissonance, this I don't get it thing, this sense that something isn't right in the world. In 1 Peter 4, 12, he says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Now, I'm sure the early Christians felt the same way, you know, during these times of persecutions. And it didn't happen all the time during the history of the early church, but it happened periodically. You'd have these intense periods of persecutions. You know, Nero having Christians torn apart in the arena or burned alive and all these kinds of things. Peter's saying, you know, when, the, when this happens, don't let it upset your view of right and wrong and goodness and, and evil. This is not something strange that's happening to you. The implication that is that sometimes in some places this is going to be the norm rather than the exception to the people of God. In the days when, like I say, when this was written, all of this stuff was happening. And Peter's saying, why are you acting as if this is weird? This is, this is unusual. This is, this is normal. You're, you're God's people. This is what happens sometimes to God's people. Jesus said the same thing in John 15, 20. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than their master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they'll obey yours. Paul says basically the same thing in 2 Timothy 3, 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. There's something about living a godly life, being the, the righteous people of God in the midst of an evil society that brings about conflict. That brings about hardship. You know, God's people, in addition to the general challenges of living in a fallen world, you know, the sickness and the injury and all the things that we face, uh, they also face challenges from non-believers. And we're not seeing this too much yet. But as I said in the past few weeks, I wouldn't get too comfortable with that state of affairs. Um, but regardless of what is happening in our lives and what's causing it, the message of Obadiah is that the state of affairs is only temporary. Jacob will possess his inheritance. There's a time when God will set things right and the people of God will possess their inheritance. Regardless of what's happening in our life and who is causing it, it's only temporary. It's only a, a blip. For now we live in a fallen world that's tainted through and through with evil. 
Wherever the righteousness of God exists, opposition exists. But that's only true for the time being. Peter goes on in this section here in this passage in chapter 4 of 1 Peter. And he says, don't be surprised, but rejoice in so much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed for the spirit of glory. Or for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. There will, become a, there will come a day when justice reigns, where everything is set right, where the good people of God are rewarded for their, for their obedience, when the blight of sin and evil will be destroyed. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2 talks about that. And John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. You know, that's our hope. That's God's promise. That this and, and that is the perspective that helps us get through these challenging times that we face. Because from a micro perspective, from a here and now, this week, this month, this year, it doesn't make sense sometimes. Life doesn't appear to be just. The good people don't always get good things, and the evil people don't always get bad things. The good doesn't, prepare, doesn't prevail. The roadrunner does get blown up. But if we can back up, if we can take a high-level view, what they talk, you know, they talk about the 30,000-foot view of things, if we can look at it from the perspective of eternity, we see that it's only temporary. That there is a day when you and I, the people of God, will live in the bliss where there is no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more sickness, no more injuries, no more anything that has to do with evil. So for those times when the system appears to be upside down, we're suffering while those who don't know Jesus seem to be going blissfully on, the message of Obadiah is, hey, okay, this is only temporary. There is a day. It's coming. Which brings us to the final point. God's kingdom will be eternal. In verse 21, he says, Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Notice in the last section I read, Jacob will possess his inheritance. And this, takes it, this takes it to the next level. This kingdom, the kingdom that covers the earth, the kingdom in which every tribe and tongue and nation bows their knee before God the Father, this kingdom will be the Lord's. This looks to the day when God will reign supreme, not just over Eden, but over the entire world. When this looks forward to the day when the enemy of God will be crushed the people of God will be vindicated. You know, like I say, in the here and now, there may be times when our faith seems to be futile. When, as Paul says in Romans, you know, for your sake we face death all day long, we're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But when redemption comes, it's not going to be a temporary reprieve, but an eternal state of being. You know, God had given the Israelites victory over the Edomites, and victory over the Philistines, and victory over all of the surrounding nations, periodically, all through their history. But every time the enemies return, you know, you beat up on the Philistines or you beat up on the, Phil on the Edomites and they go away for a little while and everything's peaceful and calm and nice and then suddenly here they are again and the whole thing, we, we do it all over again. And the history of Israel is the story of this ongoing fight over and over again with these surrounding nations. And that's why Edom is such a good metaphor. The relationships with Edom were mirrored in the relationships with all these surrounding nations. But isn't that a picture of the life we live in? You know, we lose a job, we or a loved one face health problems, we lose a loved one, we run into financial problems, we have relationship problems, and everything in our life is just wrenched out of place. Everything's a mess. Everything's disrupted. And we get through it, and somehow or another, God gets us back on an even keel, and we have this, this period when everything seems to be sort of going along nicely, and then bang, something else comes along. 
something else blindsides us. You know, it's like life is a matter of wash and lather and rinse and repeat. You know, it's just this, this, this cycle that we go through that was mirrored in the Israelites. You know, I think of those 150 families that are going to be affected by the deer layoffs that were announced this week. And here we are in this roaring economy where everybody that wants a job can have a job. And, I, you know, I'm sure these families were thinking in terms of, you know, a certain sense of security. They're making confident plans for the future. They're, you know, maybe we'll get a new house. Maybe we'll, we'll get a new car and you know, pay down some debt, pay some, you know, get some money set aside for our children's education. <coughs> and the next day they're facing unemployment. And it's like, wow. You know, what do you do with that? You know, as much as, I don't know about you, but as much as I like the temporary retreats, those times in life where things are just skating and things are smooth and things are nice, you know, we all love those things, but I'm really looking forward to something just a little bit more lasting, a bit more eternal. And that's what God's promising here. He's saying, you know, I'm not going to give you a temporary victory over the enemy. I'm not going to give you a, a few months or a few weeks or a few years of skating along nicely with no problems. The times of these temporary retreats are going to end. What's coming is the eternal kingdom of God, which will be shared by his people forever and ever. You know, ultimately, and I'll wrap this up. Well, we're actually going to, I'm going to wrap this up early today, so that's my present for you. Uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes in life we're the road runner, sometimes we're the coyote, sitting with a goofy expression and an amble on our heads. But the message of Obadiah, and for that matter, the message of the whole Bible, Old Testament news, is that there's coming, there's coming a time for the faithful followers of Jesus when it's all road runner. And I bring this up, you know, periodically I touch on this theme. I've probably preached on it maybe three or four times in the past year. And I think that because I, you know, as I look out here, I, I see all of us have been here. Probably within the last year that I've been here, all of us have been in one of these sitting there with the anvil on your head states. And I just think it's a good thing to be reminded that, you know, this is a temporary thing. God will bring us through. He will set us on a firm foundation. We are going to have a temporary reprieve again. Well, you know, things are going to get good. Get but then at the end, we, it's, it's permanent. It's forever. Everything that we struggle with today will be gone. And it's just going to be bliss in heaven forever. So I'd like to end today with the encouragement of Paul from Romans 8. Writing to a people undergoing suffering, both of the persecution kind and probably the general life kind, Paul wrote, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those he predestined he also called, and those he called he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What should we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him, himself up, gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We consider the sheep in the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you. We thank you that uh, we have these promises. And we know there's going to be times in this life when we're challenged, when things don't make sense, when we ask the, we ask the why questions. Why does this happen to this world? What's going on? No. And we just ask God that you'll continually remind us of those times that you are in this, that you are working everything together for the good of all of us who call Jesus our Lord. And Father, we pray that you'll keep us faithful, that you work in our hearts and our lives, 
uh, that we can continue to follow Jesus until the time that we meet him in heaven, when we sit at his feet, when we worship, and we just enjoy the, the time that you've prepared for us when all of these things that we face today in this life that are a challenge will be gone. So make us faithful, Lord. Keep us on track. And uh, help us to encourage one another as within this congregation as we encounter these, these situations. Let us be the resource that you've called us to be. We pray these things in Jesus' name.